January 1977. Bitter temperatures swept across the eastern United States during one of the coldest months on record. As temperatures plummeted, so did supplies of natural gas, plunging much of the Northeast, South, and Midwest into a heating crisis. It was an especially punishing winter in Buffalo, New York, where an economy that once hummed with heavy industry was in recession, and the city was hard pressed to combat the weather. By the second week in December, we had already picked up our annual snowfall of 93 inches. We knew it was going to be a bad winter already. By mid-January, 126 inches of snow had fallen. For the most part, residents took the weather in stride. I think they bear up very well. And I think, in a way, the weather, especially snow, has, has made people from this area very durable. Um, they're, they're hardy people. On January 26, 24-year-old David Zembricki was driving home from his job at an oil refinery. It was just after midnight, and the snow was falling once again. He decided to follow the Buffalo Skyway, a concrete bridge that arches 110 feet into the air. As he entered the skyway, the storm intensified. It's like driving basically in a screen of white. It's like somebody put a, a sheet over your windshield, and you just, you're hoping that you don't hit anything. When David reached the peak of the bridge, traffic came to a standstill. At first, Zimbricki wasn't concerned. He had a full tank of gas and a warm winter coat. Police officer Duane Bonamici was dispatched to block traffic from entering the skyway. Bracing himself against the 40 degree below zero wind chill, he inched his way from one stranded car to the next, making sure the drivers had enough gas to weather the storm. He also had reason to fear for his own life. The street lights looked like little pinheads of light, and you had difficulty uh, uh, knowing where you were and had any reference points to. Uh, and my main concern was, was maybe walking off the skyway. After checking on about 40 stranded cars, he turned toward another stretch of road. Behind a truck, he noticed a strange mound. As he drew closer, he realized it was a car buried in the snow. There were no signs of life. The engine wasn't idling. The windshield was caked with snow and ice. Officer Bonamici scratched through the frost with his fingernail and looked inside. Yeah, I still couldn't see anything, but I just had a feeling that there was something there. The driver's door was frozen shut. Bonamici yanked it open. There this fellow was, sitting there with a sheet over him, a white sheet. He had frost on his, on his eyelids and on his eyebrows, and his lips were blue, and his face was the color of the sheet. I didn't know where the sheet started and his skin ended and vice versa. Bonamici carried the victim to a nearby truck where he was wrapped in blankets. He had discovered the man just in time. Up ahead on the skyway, David Zimbricki was now four hours into his ordeal and was no longer alone. He had taken in three other motorists when each of their vehicles had run out of gas. By 5.30 a.m., Zimbricki's gas gauge had slipped to about a quarter tank. He figured there was enough fuel to last another hour. Suddenly, he noticed emergency vehicles on the bridge, and just as quickly, the flashing lights disappeared into the veil of snow. By 6 a.m., with his car covered in several inches of snow and his gas tank in the red zone, Zimbricki was nervous. Then he spotted shadowy figures headed towards his car. They were firefighters tethered to each other to keep the winds from wrenching them apart. One by one, they led Zembricki and the other stranded passengers to an emergency van and drove them off the skyway. 
the fact of being on this bridge in this storm was an incident I'll never forget. It was like just sheer relief to be out of there. Thursday, January 27th. Dawn revealed a string of half-buried cars scattered along the road. The blustery condition set an ominous tone for the next day. I think that storm was probably the precursor to the big one. Um, forecasters began to look now up into northern Canada and see another significant storm system develop. Buffalo's horrendous winter was about to go from bad to worse. The storm system was heading towards a city already buried in snow. The street sanitation crews were overwhelmed. Plow drivers were road weary. I had working men, a couple of gentlemen I can think of, that just broke down and they're crying to me. Like, the snow's coming. Every time I plow it, more snows are coming. And we'd hug each other and I'd have a tear with them, really, because they were, it's just like going to battle. Friday, January 28th, 1977. By 7 a.m., snow was falling once again. Ferocious winds and snow were already hammering Cleveland, Toledo, and Erie, Pennsylvania. Buffalo was next in line. At that time, we decided that something that we've never done before, we would go out with a blizzard warning. The warning was issued around 10.45 a.m. About 30 minutes later, the storm began its sweep across a frozen Lake Erie. A city trained to deal with snow was about to be pummeled by the storm of the century. We were January 28th, 1977. Buffalo, New York was in the grips of what would become a five-day battle with nature. The most severe blizzard in its history was sweeping across the icy surface of Lake Erie. The wind snatched loose granules of snow, amounting to 40 inches in some places, and hurled them at the city. When the winds came through, they picked up that tremendous snowpack off of Lake Erie and dumped it on Buffalo. And as it hit the buildings and hills and trees and everything that was standing across this area, the snow began to drift and it drifted to extreme heights. Street Sanitation Commissioner James Lindner was in his office in City Hall when he got a phone call from a local TV weathercaster warning him of the impending storm. Lindner looked out his fifth floor window. He was riveted as the storm advanced across the lake. I just saw a dark, heavy cloud coming this way, I saw it coming. It was something that I knew was gonna be big and catastrophic. I had no idea it would be as big as it was. Alarmed, he called the city garage and put his staff on alert. He also thought of his wife, who would soon leave their house for an appointment at the hairdresser's. Lindner called to tell her to stay home, but she ignored his advice. And of course, she thinks I'm the biggest pessimist in the world, and, you know, he's just trying to keep me home. The storm descended like a white wall, its winds gusting at more than 50 miles an hour. It whipped through side streets and barreled through downtown Buffalo. All over the place, people were being pulled in off the streets. People were being pulled out of cars. People were being picked up off the snow because they were literally being knocked down. Police officer Raul Rusi was at city court waiting to testify in a criminal case. But the judge had to dismiss court because attorneys and witnesses weren't able to get there. So Rusi made his way outside and was blasted by the storm. The wind 
was pushing and cutting in my face, and you could hardly breathe. And, uh, you know, I had wrapped my jacket up over my head part of the time because I just couldn't see. At City Hall, department heads began releasing workers early. So did the city's business community. Workers rushed to their cars to begin the drive home. But had no idea they were heading into what would become the most severe blizzard in the city's 145-year history. Traffic quickly came to a standstill. Buffalo was paralyzed. They would panic and leave the cars in the middle of the street and go into the nearest buildings. Eventually, the entire city became a parking lot. If you visualize car wheels spinning, the noise of the wind, people running from one place to the other, cars half stuck in the middle of the street, you know, just people trying to make it to the first door they can. Seeking shelter was no option for the city snowplow drivers. The blizzard was gaining strength, and James Lindner was directing his drivers like troops in battle. They were told to stay in their, stay in their position. I don't want you running in here. I like stuff for gasoline. Later that day, Lindner had to reverse the order and bring his drivers back in to protect them from the raging storm. As you've seen, we have several of our men uh, on cots on the second floor. We're waiting for the weather to subside. Uh, we can't do anything effectively out there. The visibility is zero. One plow driver, Bill Kennedy, a 15-year veteran, became snowbound in his rig near the lakefront. He radioed for help, but in the blinding snow, searchers couldn't find him. They could only hope for a break in the storm. The city was not prepared for uh, a blizzard of this magnitude. I don't think any city in the country, no matter how much equipment they had, could have been prepared. By early evening, many residents had to settle for temporary shelter. Others had managed to battle their way home. On the west side of Buffalo, at 5 p.m., Joseph and Laura Falzone considered themselves lucky. They had closed their corner grocery store two hours early and were sitting down to dinner with their children. The Falzones had been in the neighborhood for 43 years. At first, they had a small apartment above their store. That was now rented to an elderly woman while the family lived in a house just north of the store. As they ate dinner, the conversation inevitably turned to the weather. Their 23-year-old son, Joe, was worried about the snowbound streets. I go, you know, if there's a fire in this city tonight, there's no way the fire department is going to be able to, to get to this fire, and I could see major damage. The peaceful night was soon interrupted. Some boy tapped on my door and says, your store is on fire. I says, oh my God, so I ran out with no clothes, just my shirt on. The store wasn't on fire, but the house on the other side of the foul zones had burst into flames. Someone in the neighborhood pulled the fire alarm box on a nearby corner, alerting the Buffalo Fire Department at 7.53 p.m. Joseph's son, Joe Falzone, an amateur photographer, grabbed his camera and ran into the street to shoot pictures. Within minutes, fire was devouring the house, and the flames were spreading toward the fell zones. As the wind caught the fire, it intensified it, and it was like throwing gasoline on the fire. And because the houses were so close together, the wind channeled between the houses, and, and it was like a blowtorch. Soon, nothing stood between the inferno and his childhood home. It was only a matter of time before the fire would spread. In the raging blizzard, firefighters would have to take to the streets to save the neighborhood. But nature's ferocity was bent on destroying the city. It would be a battle to the end. On January 28, 1977, 
the most severe blizzard in Buffalo, New York's history was ravaging the city. At the same time, a desperate situation was unfolding on the city's west side. A house fire was in danger of destroying an entire neighborhood. 23-year-old Joe Falzone knew his family's home was in danger. The fire was quickly closing in on it. He ran inside to warn his family that they had only minutes to decide what to save and then get out. You say, okay, what am I gonna grab in 15 minutes? As I'm running into the kitchen, what could I grab? A refrigerator too big, microwave. Take the microwave. I started grabbing her crystal out of her cabinet. She had just ironed all these shirts and I'm whipping them on the floor, but I figured shirts, $100, crystal, 1,000, grab the crystal. His mother's mission was to save $4,000 in vacation money she and her husband had hidden. I had put the money up in our uh, drop ceiling, and when I went to feel for it, I didn't feel anything, so I thought my husband had taken it. Strangers who had seen the fire were lining up at the Falzone's door, passing boxes of possessions down the line and taking them to the family's van for safekeeping. Joe ran to the second floor to grab his valuables, but flames were already shooting through a window. It was like a volcano erupting, a roar, and as the wind was blowing between our houses, and as I ran down the stairs and was running through my parents' house, the windows were cracking, drapes were catching on fire, the smoke was billowing in. As I looked back, that's the last thing I saw. Joe's father had run to the apartment above the grocery store to rescue his 80-year-old tenant. Though he told her the store was in the path of a fire, she stubbornly refused to leave. I almost had to carry her out, and then when I do get her out, she tells me, oh, I gotta go back home, I left my four dollars on the table. And I told her, well, don't worry about the four dollars, I'll give it to you. As he led her to the safety of a hardware store across the street, Falzone remembered the $4,000 he had hidden in his kitchen ceiling. Defying the danger, he ran inside. And I went in to see if I could get my money from the kitchen ceiling that I had put up there for a trip to Greece the following week. Well, that money burned, so we never went on our trip to Greece. Dispatchers were sending fire trucks to fight their way through the snow-clogged streets to the neighborhood. But fire captain Phil Morana's truck could only get within two blocks of the blaze. The battalion chief handed Morana a portable radio and told him to go on foot and confirm there was a fire. I think I was like a block away and I started to see a glow in the sky and I could smell smoke. At that point, I, I radioed it for a second alarm, just from the glow, which is a little unusual, but it was a large glow in the sky. Firefighter Tom Schultz was navigating engine number nine through a maze of abandoned cars and snow drifts. The trip to Virginia and Whitney normally took three minutes. After 35 minutes, Schultz was finally approaching the intersection. Streets are narrow, um, double parked on either side, and you're, tr you're trying to get this big pumper through there. Just by sheer luck, we got down in front of the fire. By this time, four houses, including the Falzones, were engulfed in flames. The embers from the fire were as big as uh, TV sets flying across the street. And I'm thinking if this fire jumped the street, we're going to lose the city because houses are really close together over there. At 8.27 p.m., it was declared a three-alarm fire. All available equipment and personnel were dispatched to the scene. But the roads were barely passable. In the newsroom at the Buffalo Evening News, Lee Coppola could hear the firefighters' palpable frustration on the police scanner. We kept hearing these fire calls. We can't get there. And the firefighters were on the two ways, panic in their voices because they knew there was a fire. They knew it was a home and the threat of an entire city block going up in flames, and they couldn't get there. 
Residents around the block were quickly evacuated. They sought refuge in houses and a neighborhood church. Firefighters who could get to the scene doused the buildings next to the fire, including the Falzone's grocery store, to keep the flames from spreading. After several hours, they were finally able to put out the fire. Five houses were destroyed, two others badly damaged. The Falzones had lost their home, but their store survived. Amazingly, no lives were lost. Yeah, that was probably the worst fire I was ever at as far as house fires go. With the fire extinguished, a 50 below zero wind chill iced over the scene. Water crept up to the running boards of engine number nine, freezing the truck to the road. It was now near midnight. The blizzard had raged for more than 12 hours. The governor of New York had declared a state of emergency. In office buildings and hotels in downtown Buffalo, nearly 13,000 people who couldn't make it home settled in for a long night. The stranded resigned themselves to waiting out the storm. Police officer Raul Rusi and his partner were out on the beat. They were chauffeured by a local resident with a four-wheel drive vehicle. Around midnight, dispatchers sent them to an apartment complex to check on the report of a death. When Rusi arrived, he struggled through deep snow to get to the unit. An elderly woman told him her 80-year-old husband had died following a long illness. She led Rusi to a bedroom to show him the body. Rusi explained the city was in the midst of the worst storm in its history, and help couldn't arrive that night or the next day. He suggested she prop the window, and when the storm was over, someone would be out. She looked at me just as cool as can be and said, son, I spent over 40 years with this man, one day more, dead or alive, it really is okay, I'll be okay. When you are done with this, just remind them that I'm here and that I really need some help. He accepted the woman's offer for a hot cup of coffee, but the break was brief. Rusi knew he'd have to trudge back out into the cold. By 4 a.m., the wind chill had plunged to 55 below zero. Snow drifted over thousands of cars scattered along roadways. Emergency workers searched the roads and cars for survivors. Firefighter Tom Schultz was driving on an expressway, hunting for survivors. He ordered another fireman off the truck to guide him through the snow. When it's blowing at you like that, it's like a thousand little things coming at you and you can't, you can't see far. Your foot's on the gas on the brake, on the gas, on the brake, make sure you don't get too close to him. After 45 minutes of creeping along at barely a mile an hour, the truck's headlights revealed a man walking along the highway with a blanket wrapped around him. He looked up and he had this surprised look on his face. He, oh, oh my God, I'm saved. The man was dressed in only a pair of jeans and a light jacket. Firefighters brought him back to the firehouse to warm him up. Later that night, over coffee, Schultz finally had an opportunity to chat with the man and learned he owned a fruit and vegetable company outside Buffalo. Every year after that, on the anniversary of the blizzard of 77, he would send down a basket of fruit and vegetables to that firehouse that I was at till he passed away. We got a, <laughs> a basket of fruit from the man and a card saying, you saved my life. He wasn't the only grateful survivor. City plow drivers had helped locate one of their own road warriors. Bill Kennedy had been stranded in his rig near Lake Erie for 15 hours. When he came in, they're all hugging each other and loving each other and crying. Never seen anything like it in my life. In fact, I shed a tear myself, you know. It was now near dawn on Saturday, January 29, 1977. Reporter Lee Coppola had spent the night in a back room at the Buffalo Evening News office downtown. 
he headed outside with a group of co-workers for his first look at his hometown. I am still awestruck by the sight that I saw, just complete desolation. Um, I remember describing it later as if a bomb had fallen and the community was filled with radioactive dust that was white. There wasn't anything that stirred. The people of Buffalo had helped one another through the night, but they wouldn't be able to rest. The storm system was stalled over the region and it seemed determined to punish the city once again. Saturday, January 29th, 1977. Buffalo, New York was trying to dig out from a catastrophic blizzard. Vicious winds hurled loose snow that had gathered on the frozen surface of Lake Erie and buried the city. I think the eyes of the world uh, were on Buffalo from the minute the first reports of the intensity and the ferocity of that blizzard hit the wire services. If you're sitting in Phoenix, Arizona, and you're looking at a, a picture of what the blizzard looked like in Buffalo, New York, your first thought is, how could those people live? It was like somebody just threw a big, a big tub of water on the city, and it froze. Sit. Nowhere was that more evident than on the city's west side. Water runoff from a devastating fire had covered parts of the neighborhood in a blanket of ice. Fire engine number nine was locked in nearly two feet of ice. Looters had stripped it of its radios, brass nozzles, anything of value. The Falzone family had lost almost everything in the fire. In the rubble of their burned out home, they found some silver coins and a small section of their dishwasher. Plates and bowls had disintegrated from the heat. Anything that they had from their years of marriage, pictures of my sisters, eight millimeter videos of us growing up, um, uh, little mementos from trips they went on, gone. Nature had unleashed some of its harshest weapons. Even a city accustomed to fighting winter's fury had been overwhelmed. Volunteers from snowmobile clubs, the Red Cross, and the Salvation Army flocked to help police, firefighters, and hospitals. They delivered insulin to trap diabetics. Rescuers dug through snow in search of survivors among some of the 7,000 cars littering roadways. We had no tow trucks in the city. We couldn't even tow them. We had six and five were down. I said to the mayor, I says, we're in trouble. I said, the city's in bad shape and we're going to lose the city. Mayor Stanley Mikowski made a personal plea to residents to stay put and keep off the streets. So I'm asking all of our citizens, please cooperate. Those of you who are at home, don't come out with your vehicles. Keep those in the garages and please stay home. Street Sanitation Commissioner James Linder was at the city garage trying to get a handle on the weather. I'm always watching the weather on TV under these kind of circumstances. And lo and behold, these two guys are, are singing to me, Commissioner Linder, where are the plows? <laughs> to the tune of where are the clowns? On Saturday night, President Jimmy Carter declared federal emergencies in parts of western New York, including Buffalo. On Sunday, January 30th, New York Governor Hugh Carey arrived in a cargo plane filled with snow removal equipment. This is an unnatural, disastrous condition, and the economic consequences in an already recessed area are such that the area cannot be expected to go it alone. Early in the day, the punishing wind let up slightly, 
the veil of snow that had covered the region for 48 hours lifted. Some of the 13,000 people who were stranded in hotels, offices, and factories decided to try for home. James Lindner's wife had stepped out Friday morning for her weekly hair appointment and hadn't been able to return. She drove a few blocks to her boss's house and spent two days there with several co-workers. Lindner grabbed a truck and slowly navigated the city streets to pick her up. When he walked in, he heard a familiar song being played. They got a piano player in there. They're all drinking champagne. And this is the song I got on the piano when I walked in. Commissioner, where are the plows? Just as people thought they were coming out of this one or two day storm, they were thrown right back into Arctic and blizzard-like conditions. The unthinkable happened. The blizzard struck again. Cutting winds and blowing snow shut down roads that had just reopened. In the suburbs, drifts as high as two stories and as hard as concrete threatened to lock people in. Many turned to their own arsenal of shovels and picks to try and break out of their homes. By Wednesday, February 2nd, U.S. Army troops and more National Guard units arrived to help the city dig out. The people of Buffalo hoped they had endured the worst of the storm, but the threat still loomed as a team of rescue personnel prepared to embark on a life and death mission. Wednesday, February 2nd, 1977. Buffalo, New York was struggling with the effects of the worst blizzard in its history. A driving ban was in effect as snow crews worked around the clock to reopen snow-choked roads. 80 miles south of the city in Bradford, Pennsylvania, Jill Thiel Holes was watching Buffalo's plight on television. Bradford got four inches of snow, and another foot was on the way. A more manageable winter storm. And it's like, I'm glad I'm here and not in Buffalo. I had no reason to go to Buffalo. So it's like, Buffalo can have their snow and, and we'll keep ours. But Jill had other worries. Her five-month-old son, Robbie, had suffered from flu-like symptoms for about a week. Despite a consultation with a pediatrician, Robbie's condition hadn't improved. Around four o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, Jill brought her son to see a different doctor, who immediately hospitalized him. Within hours, Robbie took a turn for the worse. All this stuff's going through my head, it's like, he wasn't that sick. He, he had a little fever at home. We thought it was maybe the flu. And it's like he went from being a little bit sick to very critically ill. Through the night and into Thursday, the hospital ran tests, but doctors couldn't pinpoint the problem. Beth Price, a young registered nurse, sat at Robbie's bedside. This was the first time I was assigned to sit with a baby that was this ill. This baby was just very, very floppy. Could move him around in the bed and his arms and legs would just flop backwards and his head would just flop backwards. By afternoon, Robbie began a steady decline. Periodically, he'd go into seizures and stop breathing. His temperatures spiked at around 107 degrees. Nurses stuffed bags of ice around him to cool his fever. In the middle of the night, Dr. Narayan Nayak contacted the Children's Hospital in Buffalo, where most urgent pediatric cases were referred from Bradford. I felt, you know, if the Robbie did not go to Children's Hospital that night, he would not make it. But the roads into Buffalo remained largely impassable. 
a command pilot at the New York Army National Guard base near the city, said it was too risky to send a chopper to Bradford in near zero visibility. At four o'clock on Friday morning, John Cudmore, a doctor and lieutenant colonel with the National Guard, received a call at the armory from the command pilot. He says, if you're nuts enough to fly in this weather, I think we can fly, so this would have been his, uh, his way of putting it. Visibility had improved enough, but as the engine was revving, the co-pilot knew it was a risky flight. If we had to set it down in the hills or out in the woods, he probably would have froze to death because uh, I don't think they would know where to send a rescue aircraft if we had to go down for any reason. I think the way that one would uh, describe the mission best is that you either get a, a very nice medal for doing it or they ask your next of kin to pay for the helicopter because you're either going to be totally successful or it's going to be a great mess. The Huey chopper lifted off from Buffalo and started toward Bradford, Pennsylvania. From the start, winds kicked up snow squalls and buffeted the chopper. At times, visibility was less than an eighth of a mile. Their best hope was to follow a familiar landmark, a power line that ran between Buffalo and Bradford. Power lines are very, very nice in that they are maintained and trees are cut down around them. So you have a perhaps a hundred yard swath that you can put an aircraft through and as long as you don't hit the power lines, you will make it down to where you're going. Hovering 10 to 20 feet above the power lines, Joe Chapados relied on his co-pilot to guide him by looking through a window below the foot pedals. 50 minutes after taking off from Buffalo, the helicopter landed at Bradford Hospital. Robbie was transferred into an incubator and whisked into the chopper. 10 minutes later, they lifted off again. And it's snowing and snowing and horrible. And it's like, dear God, just please get this helicopter, this baby, everybody there safe. In back, Dr. Cudmore went to work. With temperatures in the cabin around 40 degrees, he tucked his thick wool sweater around Robbie to keep him warm. The next challenge was ensuring the infant received the right amount of oxygen. Since Robbie could not communicate, Cudmore reached his finger below the sweater and enticed the boy to grab it. When he would start to let go, it would uh, mean that he was starting to slip out of consciousness and starting to go to sleep, which of course we did not want him to do during the flight. So you would turn up the dial on the oxygen tank. It was a difficult flight, but the storm that had terrorized the city had lifted. Around 10 a.m., the chopper touched down safely at the Children's Hospital in Buffalo. Robbie was diagnosed with a congenital condition in which his body couldn't process protein. Doctors also learned that as a result of the disorder or from the number of times he stopped breathing, Robbie had suffered severe brain damage. After six weeks in the hospital, Robbie's condition stabilized and he was discharged. He lived with the disorder for 17 years before dying, but his mother remains forever thankful for the time he lived. If it wouldn't have been, for the National Guard, we wouldn't have had the 17 years that we had with him. I thank God every day they could come and get him and do what they did for him. For their heroism, the crew received the New York State Medal of Valor, the highest award given by the state to its military forces. After the storm, troops and civilians converged on Buffalo, helping the city take back its streets. The blizzard claimed 29 lives across the region. Many froze to death in cars or died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Damage exceeded $300 million. On Saturday, February 5th, President Carter declared nine counties in northern and western New York federal disaster areas. 
It was the first time the designation had been made due to snow. I believe that it saved the city because it gave us a light at the end of the tunnel. We needed cash to repair things. We needed money to supplement and to refill the coffers. Without that, the city would have died. Records show during the course of the blizzard, just over 15 inches of snow fell. That was on top of the several feet of snow that had blanketed the area earlier in the season. But it was the combination of loose snow, unceasing winds, and icy temperatures that brought the city to its knees. To get a five to six day period of time with these types of conditions was certainly unprecedented, and I would consider a once in a hundred year event. It took two and a half weeks to clean up the city and find a way to deal with the snow. Some was loaded into rail cars and sent south to melt. Though battered, Buffalo and the surrounding area persevered. It showed that, you know, we are a strong community. I think everybody became better for that because uh, uh, it gave you a sense of helping people, you know, and not having such a, a devastating thing like that ruin a community. To this day, Buffalo residents remain ever mindful of winter's fury. I'll never forget the blizzard. Never, never, never. You're just out there constantly fighting Mother Nature, you know. She was a bitch. Pardon my French. I think people up until the blizzard of 77 in Buffalo understood snow, could cope with snow, could shovel it off their front walks. The blizzard of 77 taught people that sometimes nature's not gonna let you do that. Sometimes nature is so powerful and so strong, it's going to overcome even the best efforts of man. In December 2001, Buffalo would be pelted again. What had promised to be a white Christmas turned into a record-breaking five-day storm that closed the city down. By storm's end, nearly seven feet of snow had fallen. Three people in the Buffalo area lost their lives, including an 83-year-old who died when his carport collapsed. Though the death toll may not have been as high as it was in the blizzard of 1977, Buffalo residents were reminded once more of the power of nature. <laughs>